<sighs> well, somebody, who am I talking to? Am I talking to you guys at home and you guys here? Are we live? Are we good to go? Hey, everybody, we are live. Thanks for waiting for us. There's always something around here, and uh, uh, we got power back up and running, so it could go any second. If it does, that just means you all have to sing that much louder, all right? I can't cover you up. I can't do that anymore. You have to sing. But... Let's make this official. Merry Christmas, everybody. Happy Advent season. We are glad that we are here together. And whether you are at home or whether you are here to honor the king that is coming, will you stand with us and let's sing together. Here we go. Whoa. to all of you here in the sanctuary with us and to you at home or in your house church. It is good to be together, isn't it? And wow, look at this stage. Isn't it beautiful? Thank you, Lisa Wagner, Greg Wagner, Christina Thom, Jeremy Thom, Daniel Johnson, who bought trees, and anybody else who made it so beautiful. I love Christmas, don't you? And yeah, let's applaud them. So pretty, so pretty. 
um, want to let you know that if you've got questions, needs, prayer requests, fill out the card online. You can give to our ministry online or through the MSCC app. Um, there are more of us together today in the sanctuary. 75 of us can gather, and so we've opened up registration for December Sundays. So get registered so you can come be with us. Um, if it is full, go ahead and get on the waiting list. And if we need to add another service, we will do that. So Daniel, Pastor Daniel wants you to know that next week we will have a program for our middle and high school students. You will need to register. He'll send out information to you, but you're going to start meeting. Um, our Christmas Eve service, we actually get to have one in person, as of now anyway. So Christmas Eve, December 24th at 5 o'clock, we will have uh, an in-person service. We will live stream it, so if you aren't able to be there, you can watch it at your convenience. Um, you know how special our Christmas Eve service is. You don't want to miss it. Um, we are continuing the food drive for the Oregon Food Bank. You may have noticed some garbage cans in front of the church doors. We want to fill that with food. Um, as you've been hearing on the news, there's a scarcity. People are in line that have never been in line before. We've invited our community to be a part of this, our neighborhood. So be the generous people that you are. You are all so generous. As a staff, we're always humbled by your generosity. So this is a way to show Jesus' love to those in need. And finally, our um, DHS baskets, the registration has closed for that. But we do need some people Friday night to put the baskets together and Saturday morning to deliver them to the DHS offices. So if you are interested, let Jeremy know at jeremy at meadowsprings.org. Let him know um, that you're willing to help with that. And thank you for your generosity. What a gift this is going to be to the biological parents and their littles for Christmas. And last but not least, our Alyssa Ricky and her two, her two littles are going to lead us in our Advent this morning. Hi, we're the Ricky family. We're gonna light up this next candle. Okay, can you can you tell them your name? My name is Luke, and this is Mama. And She's who are you? Our friend, and that's Benny. Miss Benny! Yeah. So it's the season of Advent where we're yeah. anticipating the birth of Jesus. Yeah, and we're going to so, light up the next candle. Yeah, last week's candle represented hope, and this week's theme is peace, because in John 14, 27, what did Jesus say about peace, Luke? Peace I give to you. My peace. peace I leave with you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Yeah. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Okay, Benny, it's time Amen. to light the candle. Amen. No. Let's light the candle. No. We have to light the candle. No. Luke, come back over here. Stay next to no. me. Okay. I, we need to light the candle. We'll light the candle. Yes, that's what we're here to do. No. 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 Okay, Luke, come over here. Stay next to me. Okay. Okay.
shout out and we lift our voices and we declare glory to you Lord because we long for the day when that will be the one and only song that is sung over this new earth for Lord we long for you we long for your peace and we long for all the pain and the suffering and the sickness and the illness we long for the poor to be gone we long for discrimination to be gone and we just long for your peace and so as we enter this Advent season, Lord, in a year that has felt so, so long, may this year of any, may we understand what it means to wait for you in hope. May you remind us what it means to yearn and to long for only you, every day that we live here, wanting only you. And so we come and we do, we join, we join in the story of old. We sing with the sages and with the angels, with the shepherds. And we look to even the prophets of old to remind us who you are. For we are grateful for all that you've done. And now we come <laughs> to know you in even greater ways. So we are here, Lord. We are listening. May your word bring life to us. In your precious name, amen. You may be seated. In Isaiah, it says, Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. 
Is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Hello. Hello. Well, here we are at the end. Well, at least for me, it's the end. I, I, I don't know about you. I, I hope it's not for you. But for me, it's the end. I've come to the end of my life. I will not survive the current king. His name is Manasseh, emphasis on the middle syllable there. <laughs> He's a faithless king. He has no regard for God, but he has plans for me. He is going to kill me. I have seen that. That is one of the curses of being a prophet of God. You see things and then you carry the burden of the things that you see. My name is Isaiah, the son of Amos, and I have been a seer for the Lord, a prophet for the Lord, uh, over 50 years now. Being a prophet is not something that you seek out. It's not something you want to do. It's something you're chosen for. It's, it's a thing that you submit to. Not very long ago, one of our uh, ranks attempted to say no. <laughs> he ended up marinating for three days in the uh, stomach juices of a great fish. Uh, no is really not an option when God calls you to, to be a prophet. I was 20 years old when uh, God chose me. And I have spoken now for him through the reigns of five kings of Israel. During that time, I have seen many things. Uh, I, I have seen kingdoms rise and fall. I have seen the birth and the burial of kings. I have seen the land flow with fruit and with grain. And I have seen it wilt as grass wilts in a furnace. I have seen God's people bow stupidly before statues of stone and, and wood. And I have seen them sing joyfully before the Lord in his temple. I, I have seen and heard mothers screaming for their children. Homes burning, swords flashing, blood running in the streets. And I have seen God sweep away an enemy as a, as a scythe mows down the wheat during harvest time. I have seen the, the weakness and frailty of man. And I have also, I have also seen with my own eyes, the unspeakable glory of the Lord Almighty. Now what I see is the end. Uh, yes, the end for me, Manasseh will murder me, but more importantly, the end for Israel. The great empires, uh, Assyria uh, up to the north, uh, ancient cities of Babylon out to the east, Egypt as old as deserts, down to the south, they are beginning to stir, growing restless, 
like great beasts rising off of their haunches, beginning to snap at one another, hungry for flesh. And little Israel in between them will be consumed by them. I've seen that. I've seen that. Which of you wants to be a prophet? Well, I need to warn you. The burden is heavy. The perks are few. Sure, sometimes someone invites you over for dinner. They usually want you to read their palm or tell their future or something like that. You know, there, there is one consolation, though, a very real consolation that I, that I can share with you. It, it's the thing that sustained me through all those years, all those dark years in Israel, the, the one thing that I held on to. And, and that is that at those times when I would speak for the Lord, I could feel his presence with me. He was close. And there was, uh, there was comfort in that. I, I don't know what your lives are like. I don't know what you have faced. I don't know what you're facing right now. But I can tell you during those dark times, those years when the burden to speak for the Lord to a people who were faithless to him or was heavy, that the sense of God's presence was a great comfort. I felt like I was working uh, alongside him on, on his plan and to know that he was with me. That brought me comfort. And during those times, I, I wished very, very often that the people of my country would turn to him so they too could experience the, the sense of his presence and, and the comfort and strength that it provided. I, I, I'd wish that that was the case. In fact, I can tell you that that's the one thing I hold on to even now at the end when I see where things are going, uh, there's one thread that runs through all of those years leading to this moment, one thread of promise, and that is that God has made a promise of his presence, that he has, he has told me, and through me he has told my people that he would one day be present with them. I, I remember the first time that I, uh, I heard that word from the Lord. It, it, it came very early in the years of my ministry, and it came through the vision of a child. Well, I, I know you're probably thinking, oh no, here he goes. The sentimental old man starts talking about children and grandchildren and, you know, getting all mushy. You don't have to worry about that. <laughs> I, I'm not that kind of uh, sentimental old man. Uh, my tears do not, I, I, or my eyes do not start tearing up when I hear about children. I've had a few of them myself, children and grandchildren, that is. I, I know the blessing that they are. I also know if you turn your back on them, they'll burn the house down or saw the family dog in half. Uh, no, I, I, I love children, but I am not talking about uh, some kind of sentimentalism about childishness. I am talking about a specific promise from God of a specific child. I was 33 years old at the time, and Ahaz was king in Israel, or in Judah. Southern, uh, southern part of Israel. He has, had been king for six years. He was a man lukewarm to the Lord. But uh, Yahweh was about to give him a chance to prove his faith. You see, the northern ten tribes of Israel uh, had a king named Pekah. And uh, that king had... Uh, formed an alliance with the uh, nation just to the northeast of them, the nation of Syria. And the king of Syria was named Rezin. 
and Pekah and Rezin had joined together. They had a plan. They, they came to Ahaz down here in the south, and they invited him to be, become part of an alliance. And when they joined together, they would together rebel against the empire of Assyria, who was threatening. Ahaz wisely refused to join that alliance. But Pekah, the king of the northern ten tribes, Israel, had another plan. He joined with Rezin, the king of Syria, and they decided that they would invade Judah, and they would take Judah for themselves, make it their own. And they were a, a formidable foe. When, is, when, when Israel and uh, Syria joined together and swarmed into southern Judah, it is not surprising that the people and King Ahaz himself shook like trees in the wind. And that was the first time that God called me to go and to speak to Ahaz. I, I found him uh, in the city of Jerusalem up by the upper pool. He was inspecting one of the water sources for the city, and I went to Ahaz. And uh, I could see the fear in his eyes. And I spoke to him what the Lord had told me to speak. I, I said, be calm, be quiet, do not be afraid. Do not uh, let your heart be troubled. These two smoldering pieces of firewood <laughs> are about to be put out. They have threatened you, Ahaz, but they will never carry out their threats, for I am about to defeat them. But you, King Ahaz, you must be faithful. You must stand faithful, or you will not stand at all. And I left Ahaz there to consider the words of the Lord, to weigh them for himself and to, to choose. The message was clear. Do nothing. Trust God, and he will defend you. And then the word of the Lord came to me a, a, a second time with something that was uh, almost too incredible to believe. And I, I rushed to see Ahaz one more time, and I said, Ahaz, Ahaz, God has uh, offered to give you a sign. I said, choose a sign, any sign as deep as hell as high as heaven, and God will show you his strength. Now, I had grown up on the great stories of, uh, of God's actions in the life of our people, the dividing of the sea, the stopping of the, the sun, the defeating of giants. And I was excitedly anticipating the witnessing of another great wonder of God. But as I looked at Ahaz's face, I knew that he was not going to trust God. He was not going to put his faith in God. He said, I will not put the Lord to the test. Sheep hui. Those pious sounding words did nothing to, to hide this faithless man's heart. Clearly, he had already come up with a strategy of his own. I later found out that he had taken gold, he had taken valuables from his own house and from the temple of the Lord, and he had sent them to Assyria in order to beg Assyria's help against Pekah and against Rezin. And because of his faithlessness, God gave me another word to speak to Ahaz. And I said, uh, I said to Ahaz, will you test the patience of God? I will give you a sign even without your asking. Behold, a virgin will be with child and, and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. And even before that child knows the difference between right and wrong, these two kings that you are so fearful of, their land will be deserted. 
Well, isn't that amazing, that, that promise? I mean, up against the, the backdrop is this faithlessness of Ahaz, God still promises to give his presence. But then how do we understand the promise? That, that was the, the great question. What did this promise mean? Because ways of God are often mysterious to us, even, even to the prophets who proclaim those ways. God's ways are higher than our ways. His uh, thoughts are higher than our thoughts. High as the heavens are above the earth. God's ways are above ours and his thoughts above ours. I had fallen in love with a young maiden. Now, usually when the Lord gave his word to me, it was heavy and it was hard. But in this particular case, it was light and Delightful, because after the second time that I went to Ahaz, the Lord told me to go and to marry that young maiden. I enthusiastically obeyed before he changed his mind. <laughs> All of Jerusalem celebrated with us. Uh, they celebrated the ceremony. They waited for the consummation, and sure enough, that young maiden, my wife, became pregnant. Nine months later, she gave birth to a, a son. And by the word of the Lord, I, I named that son Maher Shalal Hashbaz. Uh, that means quick to the plunder, swift to the spoil. It was a word of affirmation of God's promise that Judah would come out victorious in these conflicts that it was facing. By the way, I see some young couples here. If you want to use that name for your children, <laughs> feel free to do that. Yeah, I, I really only used the full name when he was in trouble. Maher Shalal Hashbaz. <laughs> Usually I just call him Hash. <laughs> but my wife, she had her own name for him. She called him Emmanuel. Because she saw in him God's presence among us. And there was certainly truth to that. All of Jerusalem recognized our son as a fulfillment of that word that I had presented to Ahaz, that promise of God's presence with his people. But I have to tell you that uh, despite the clear way in which he affirmed God's presence, it never seemed to me that uh, hash was ever the complete fulfillment of that word. And somehow there was more spoken in that word about a virgin and a child than my wife and my son could fulfill. It wasn't very long before uh, God showed me the truth of that uh, suspicion that I had. Um, Assyria uh, began to move. And uh, Rezin and Pika soon left uh, Judah alone because they had to deal with Assyria. They had to deal with uh, this bull that was goring nations to death, nations like Syria, nations like Israel, who thought they could rebel against the bull, and a bull came down goring, and the stories poured down from the north, stories of horror, stories of obliteration, stories of defeat, horror stories. I listened to those stories, and finally I had to see for myself, and so I traveled north, and I stood on top of a mountain, and I looked down into the valley of Jezreel, and out past that into the lands of uh, Zebulun and Naphtali to the north. Fires, smoke, burned all across the land in patches. Long lines of my kin, tied together by ropes, were making their way eastward the young and the old, carts full of goods being pulled by the animals that once belonged to Israel. 
all uh, being carried off, all uh, going away. To the east, Assyria had uh, destroyed, had conquered Israel. And I stood on top of that mountain, my heart breaking for my people, searching for some sign of hope, but seeing nothing but distress and darkness and deep despair. And as I stood there, a vision from the Lord came over me. And I saw the lands of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali and the Galilee, the Sea of Galilee with the Gentiles surrounding it. And I saw the people there walking in utter darkness. And then suddenly, out of the midst of the people, there rose a light, bright as the sun, brilliant and blinding and yet warm at the same time. And it shot across the land, across all of the hilltops and down into every valley. And the people, the, the people began to rejoice. They threw back their heads and threw up their hands and began to rejoice as a, as a people rejoice at a great harvest or a great victory. And they, they began to hug one another and they were dancing and they were crying and they were laughing there in the light. And then I saw the reason for their laughter the reason for their joy, because out of the middle of the light, there arose the image of a woman with a child. And all of the people were were speaking together as if in one voice, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And then they began to give him names. They called out, He is a wonderful counselor. He is mighty God. He is everlasting father. He is prince of peace. And then God's own voice spoke in my vision from heaven and said, he will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom from this time on and forever. And I said in my vision, can it be? And the Lord's voice boomed, the zeal of the Lord God Almighty will accomplish it. And my vision was over. It was gone. But it is not gone. I have never forgotten even the smallest detail of that vision. I have served as God's spokesman and prophet and seer now for these many, many years. I have seen many things and spoken his words uh, both of the present and of the future. Words of doom, words of deliverance. But no vision that I ever received is as precious to me as that one vision of the child. You see it, don't you? The difference of this child This child is is plainly human, just as my son was human, and yet not simply human. God also, mighty God, everlasting Father, somehow human and divine in one child. I don't know how. (laughs) Don't, Don't ask me how. But I do know that there will be a virgin who will be with child and give birth to a son. And he will not simply be called Emmanuel. He will be Emmanuel. He will be God with us. I have been young and now I am old and I have waited these many years for this child. I do not know when he will come but he will come. And when he comes, he will bring the greatest gift we could ever have, the very presence of God himself living with his people. 
And so my word to you, as it was to Ahaz, be calm. Do not be afraid. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust him. Whatever enemies rage against you, despite whatever your present darkness is, trust him. Because the child is coming.
amen. You can clap it up if you want to. You don't have to be alone. Even on your couch, you can shout and you can clap because we know that the one who, reigned for, who will reign forever is Emmanuel. The one who will reign forever is with us. The one who will reign forever, his presence is with you. So have a great week knowing that our God is with you. And have a great week waiting and longing for him to come again. We'll see you all next week. Have a good one.